Good evening and welcome to Garden Hour brought to you each week by SDSU Extension. I'm Rhoda Burroughs. I will be your host tonight. I'm a SDSU Extension Horticulture Specialist based out of Rapid City. Tonight we have with us Sydney Trio with McCrory Gardens. And Sydney, uh, what are you going to be uh, bringing us from, from McCrory this week? Um, I'm going to be talking about the Three Sisters Gardens tonight. All right. And we also have with us Dr. John Ball, Extension Forestry Specialist and State Forest Health Specialist. Uh, John, what's what's on your docket tonight? All right, everybody. Well, I am the tree guy, and I'm based out of my car because I drive <laughs> this place every week. And today, I'm actually one floor below Rhoda, uh, coming to you from Rapid City, South Dakota, and I've got the latest of bugs and cruds we have, but I also have the mystery fruit, so stay tuned. <laughs> Sounds intriguing. Uh, remember, you can enter your questions in the Q&A box and watch the chat box for links to publications or websites. Take it away, Sydney. Alrighty, let me share my screen. All right, well, hello everyone. My name is Sydney Trio. I'm the Education Coordinator and Horticulturist at Mercury Gardens. And today I'll be talking about the Three Sisters Gardens. Um, so who we are, um, at Mercury, we are part of SESU, and we started off as uh, two acres in 1965, and we've expanded since to over 70 acres. Um, a little side note, the cottage here um, is actually getting remodeled right now, so maybe the next time you come out to the gardens, it'll look a little different, but um, good things happening. Um, our mission is to connect people and plants through education, discovery, research, and enjoyment of the natural and built landscape. So tonight, I'll be talking a little bit about um, some what some of the natural landscape kind of looked like. Um, so you might be asking, what is Three Sisters? It is the probably the most traditional form of companion planting. It contains corn, beans, and squash. Um, overall, it gives um, good soil fertility and a balanced diet for um, people. And it is an indigenous cultural complex, which was used for many stories, ceremonies, customs, and um, practice etiquettes. Um, a little bit more about the history. Um, there's archaeological evidence that it dates back to around 1070 AD in North America, which is a little um, over four or 500 years before the Europeans um, began to colonize. Um, it is in the Iroquois legend that um, it's kind of almost like a creation story. Um, and regardless of um, our ancestries, it's a great way to connect to the history of uh, the land. Um, so there's a bunch of different layouts that you can use. Um, one of the most common ones is the mounding. So you'll have the corn um, in the center and you'll kind of build the soil up and put the corn the tallest, and then you'll put beans around it and then squash around it. But you can also do fields and also landscapes. Uh, we've tried the mounds, um, not really as much the field because we don't have as much space, but we've also done the landscape method. Um, this year, this, this is the most accurate representation I could find of what we did, but we did um, little pockets of corn and beans and then scattered squash in between. So I have some pictures of what it um, turned out to look like. First up, we have the corn. Um, it's planted after the dangers of frost has passed. So these are the different um, corn varieties we used and we planted them on May 8th. Uh, we learned that it's best to direct sell them into the ground. Uh, in years past, we've planted them in the greenhouse and then transplanted them into the field, but um, they're just doing so much better now than they were um, as transplants. But um, some of the benefits of the corn is that they have the strong roots and then the tall height as, as a trellis. 
Um, and then next up, we have the beans, which was planted a few weeks after the corn. You can see they're about like the corn is about five inches high. And then um, something to keep in mind, you always want a pole bean and not a bush bean. Um, so you'll see that the corn will or the beans will climb up the corn and then the beans just naturally take in nitrogen from the air and convert it to a plant form. Um, so it's not like a nice fertilizer. Um, but you want to be careful. We have in our garden, we have hyacinth bean, which you do not want to eat. Um, so uh, not all of the sisters will have, you can't eat all of them, but they all work together to help each other. And in this case, this one might um, attract pollinators or it'll attract certain pests you don't want on other plants or just keep pests away um, in the first place. So. Yeah, they just all kind of work together and um, grow the best that they can. Then last up is a squash. Um, you'll want to plant the squash about a week after the beans. And what the squash does, the thick leaves kind of provide moisture for the soil and reduce erosion um, and kind of keep out some weeds. And they're supposed to deter pests um, like raccoons, but I'll show you a later picture, but here are some of the different um, squash that we used here. Um, we use a lot of pumpkins. Um, some of the benefits of Three Sisters Gardens, um, you can have higher yields. Um, some sources say up to 20% increase and it reduces the um, amount of water and fertilizer needed. And then um, you can maximize your growing space, growing all of them together. Um, and then some of the nutritional benefits. Um, this dish is known as succotash. Um, it it um, has complementary amino acids, which form complete proteins, which um, eliminates the need for meat in diets. Um, also, the white corn that is used contains a slow release carbohydrate, which helps prevent and regulate um, diabetes. And it's something that the yellow corn that we have um, today kind of lacks. So it's kind of an interesting little bit of information. And then there are other sisters that you can use. Um, so instead of corn, you could put sunflowers or amaranth. Um, so they can all provide different benefits too. So, um, so it is supposed to deter pests, but we do have some raccoon problems here. Um, this is our first one, probably in June, and we trapped it, and then we called the Humane Society, and they relocated the raccoon. And then this was about a week ago, we got another one. Um, then we thought we were good, and then... Lisa sent us a message last weekend, and um, I think that they keep releasing them, and then they keep coming back. So <laughs> um, we just today um, tried a spray to kind of help see if that keeps them away, but that's one of our biggest problems right now. But in conclusion, um, Three Sisters Garden planting is a simple way to grow your plants with many benefits, and it's a great way to connect to the history of the land, regardless of our ancestry. And then I'm just going to throw this in here quick. We do have a, our event coming up, Insect Festival, in um, September 9th. We'll have a bunch of tours going out into the gardens, finding insects. We'll have a pollinator parade and story time, but we'll have live insects. Um, interactive booths and you can actually try to eat the insects. So it's pretty neat, but yeah. Are there any other questions? Uh, trying to eat insects would be my, I'd probably get it about this far and no, no further. <laughs> you get a full sticker if you do it though. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can live without the sticker. <laughs> Um, Disclaimer, I, I haven't been brave enough to try it, but I have heard <laughs> people say that it tastes just like potato chips. Okay, <laughs> I'll take their word for it. 
I am aware they're very nutritious, but, but, but uh, I was not raised as thinking insects are edible. So. <laughs> Um, there's a question on whether you could list the varieties used, and I know you showed us some seed packets, but this person had trouble with the beans pulling the corn down. Uh, um, hmm. I can go back to the beans, what beans we had. Or was it the corn that made the difference? I'm not sure if it was uh, sweet corn that that was less stable or... <laughs> yeah. Um, these are the different beans that we used. Um, we haven't really had a problem of them uh, kind of bringing the corn down as much. Um, this is an interesting one. 1,500 years old from a, from a cave, I presume. Yeah. <laughs> and then so the corn. These are different corns. So no sweet corn in there, mm -hmm. which you kind of alluded to with the uh, the difference in the carbohydrate. All right. Well, thank you, Trio, <laughs> Sydney. Uh, yeah. We look look forward to uh, some of the events and hearing more about McCrory and in the coming uh coming months and years hopefully yeah. with that i'm going to switch and i'm going to talk some about uh some of the diseases you might see on your vegetables so just a minute here to to get us going All right, uh, this were some photos that came into the garden hotline. And uh, one of the things I wanted to point out uh, with it was uh, doing some garden cleanup as, as things are growing. Um, and we see a lot of dead leaves along the bottom area here. I would go ahead and clean those off if they have disease. Um, they're going to be sending out spores or, or uh, disease propagules um, that you don't want to have spread to the healthy foliage. So whenever you have those those uh, dying foliage, go ahead and take them off. Um, it looks like they may have done it, but anytime there's foliage beneath the first, the lowest fruit, uh, that's not actually feeding the fruit, so you can remove that also. With a lot of our leaf diseases, we'll see diseases jump from the soil if they've, if you've had diseases there in the past year or two, onto the uh, lower leaves there. So that can be a place where where disease can get started. So. Uh, that's one of the reasons why it's good to have a good mulch between the soil and, and the leaves there as well. Uh, so another thing I wanted to point out uh, with this, uh, with photos that we get, when I, when I get a photo like this, one of the first things I look for is, well, I've got yellowing leaves towards the bottom of the plant, which suggests in sort of a light, color to the foliage overall suggests to me that maybe this was a little bit low on nitrogen and so it could up the nitrogen a little bit um, but beyond that it's hard for me to see even when I when I zoomed in hard to me to see any real distinctive patterns of diseases that I look for um, then there was one photo that was that helped me a little bit on that and so I was able to zoom in a little bit more here, and you can see these how the these lower leaves are dying. Uh, looks like from the outside in, which suggests probably a water problem. 
or, or something that's coming through the stem. Um, so it may in part be some, some uh, drying out issues, uh, whether that's through uh, lack of water or some disease in the roots or crown that's, that's plugging up uh, the ability of the plant to take up water. We've got a few scattered uh, little spots on the leaves, which look to me more like insect damage than anything else. So uh, in this case, there's a little bit of a spot on this tomato here, which might suggest a bacterial speck, but, uh, but it, this was one that I couldn't diagnose given the information that we had, but just just some comments in general about tomatoes and, and plant diseases in, in the process of diagnosis. Now going to our beans, which are one of the three sisters. Uh, there are three different kinds of bacterial bean blights, and they are all uh, carried in the seed in the inside of the seed, so seed treatment on the outside uh, wouldn't affect it. Um, it can still be carried. And that's the most common way that the bacterial blight comes into a garden is in the seed itself, which is one of the reasons why we really stress getting quality seed, because they should be uh, screened for these diseases when when the seed is growing on the plant. So uh, anyway, carried in seed, uh, it can then be spread by splashing water, particularly during during the growing season. Um, it can overwinter on plant debris, not, not real strongly, but can happen occasionally. Um, and, and uh, other than keeping it out in the first place. Um, fungicides won't have much effect on this because it's a bacteria. Copper sprays don't do too much to help it uh, either. So mainly it's a case of getting good seed, uh, making sure you clean out anything if you see these symptoms, uh, don't keep them in the garden, and then looking for resistant cultivars if, you're, if you've been seeing some problems with, with beans in general. Uh, there was a question earlier about uh, length of beans, and that can, that's a combination of genetic and uh, environmental. So, uh, one of the things you might look for is, is beans that are, are known to be generally uh, longer in length um, and then having the right environment. We kind of think of beans as being able to grow without nitrogen, but that's really kind of a fallacy. What they do is they have bacteria that live on the, on the bean roots. Um, that fix the nitrogen for them and, and supply it to the plant. But that takes a while to get going. So sometimes I've seen bean plantings that are really kind of light yellow, particularly the older leaves. And again, that's a sign that it needs some nitrogen. So uh, we might have to supply a little bit of nitrogen to get it going, particularly if you did not use inoculum and you're planting in a place that hasn't had beans for say five, six, seven years. Um, so uh, just a, a side comment about that. Um, and that might also help you with those pod lengths then. Uh, water, consistent watering, of course, is the other need for, that beans have. They are quite tender and, and quite susceptible to drought. I'm going to talk about another bacterial disease that I've seen a little bit of this year. Uh, not, <laughs> not usually quite in the drought area as much, but again, this can be seed borne. And so if you if you put in, in any of the cucurbits, so that means squash, pumpkins, cucumbers, melons, any of them can get this angular leaf spot. And it can be seed borne, so it can come in on the seed. 
It can also be uh, overwintered in the debris, in plant debris. So yeah, you're going to want to do a crop rotation if you see any of these symptoms. The leaf symptoms, they're angular spots, not not round, round spots. Uh, often with bacterial diseases, you'll see them stop at the leaf vein. Whoops. Leaf vein here. Uh, with fungal spots, they more often will cross the, the leaf vein than, than bacterial spots. Uh, you may see a yellow halo around the, the spots. Um, some varieties don't show this yellow halo as much. So if you don't see the yellow halo, it doesn't mean it's not angular leaf spot. It may mean it's that variety just doesn't tend to have that halo. Uh, but the spots uh, will dry and they may drop out. So you have holes surrounded by what appeared to be a, a spot originally. Another thing you may or may not see when it's wet, after a rainy day, you go out and look on the underneath of the leaf and you may actually see drops of whitish liquid and that's actually the bacteria in the liquid there. Um, so you're actually observing the bacteria itself at that point. Uh, and then there, this will attack the fruit as well. Uh, and you'll see uh, these water-soaked uh, circular spots on the fruit and often fruit rots. And I'll show you one of those in a minute. So here's some, some cucumbers and, and squash. Uh, then again, you see these are kind of circular uh, spots on the fruit, a little bit of rot starting in. Probably not as distinctive as the uh, foliage symptoms, but but if you have both of them, that helps you know what you've got. So one of the things you want to look for is resistant varieties. There are resistant varieties of cucumbers. There may or may not be resistant varieties of some of the squash uh, and some of the others, but it, it, I've mostly seen this on uh, cucumbers more than, than other kinds of cucurbits in South Dakota. Uh, if you do have it, rotate, wait two years before you plant any of the cucurbits again. Uh, that'll allow any of the overwintering uh, bacterial spores to uh, lose enough energy so that they can't infect uh, a fresh cucurbit. And then the other thing that we're seeing quite a bit this year, uh, of course, we always see powdery mildew on something, whether it's it's winter squash or pumpkins and powdery mildew. Even though they have very similar names, their symptoms are, are fairly distinct. Powdery mildew, of course, will have that sort of powder. Uh, and it can be on both surfaces. We often see it on the top surface, but it can be on both. Um, and powdery mildew can spread in dry weather, unlike most of our diseases where you'll have to have some sort of moisture where things really get going to be a problem. So powdery mildew, we expect to see during drier, uh, drier times, whereas downy mildew likes that warm, humid weather. And uh, so the, if you, you see this, that might even be uh, confused for spider mite damage, um, sort of speckling on the top of very small uh, infections. If you turn the leaf over, you might see this water soaking. That's when it first gets going, maybe before you get this chlorosis or those yellow spots on it. Um, but my uh, way to distinguish this from some of the other types of diseases is to take a take a leaf, uh, put it in a bag overnight with a moist paper towel, um, leave it on your counter, and in the morning, if you've got this cottony growth, this sort of gray, moldy growth that's that's quite fluffy, uh, you know that you have downy mildew. 
And one last thing here, um, how to know when a honeydew melon is ripe. Uh, we talk about uh, with with uh, cantaloupe, um, we have a slip. So if you give it a gentle tug, it will separate. If it's not ripe, it won't separate. Well, honeydews don't have the slip. So how do you know when they are ripe? Uh, we look for a couple things change in color from from the younger fruit and then there should be some softening on the blossom end which is the far end that that should soften up a little bit and and that's one of the clues that that a honeydew is ripe. if you're a good sniffer you might be able to sniff the <laughs> difference as well and with that i am going to stop sharing here and see if there are our questions. Oh, yeah. If you've got some disease issues, um, I would probably go ahead and remove the mulch that was there during that during the uh, the season that you observed the the problems. Um, you might be able to use it on. Um, something that was unrelated as long as it's not something that spreads through the air uh, pretty easily uh, some of our some of our spots can do that but um, but yeah uh, take it away from from where we're going to replant with that with that particular crop cleaning tomato cages it's recommended uh especially if you've got something like uh, uh some of the viruses that are spread mechanically um whether or not you get spores on the tomato cages that can reinfect uh, it's standard practice to recommend it <laughs> i can't say whether i've actually seen any studies that look to see if if uh, they found contamination from the cages, um, but it's probably not a bad idea. And with that, I think we're ready to hear from John and hear about tree diseases. Let's see here. Let me kick this off here. Hopefully it wants to do that. Come on, computer. Oops. Uh, let's see what my computer's doing here. Uh, my computer's acting up here for some reason. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute, if I can do that even. I don't know what that did, but... We'll try it again. Uh, let's see here. All right, I'm going to stop sharing one more time, people. I apologize. Uh, Rota we saw that that time. Yeah, it just uh, it locked uh, though. Oh, okay. So. I'm Just a reminder off. for people that uh, if you don't get your questions answered during uh, tonight or if things come up during the week, you can always uh, email or call the garden hotlines in Pier, Aberdeen, Rapid City, and Sioux Falls. And I bet Evan will have those up on the chat box again if you miss the first round. All right, we're gonna try it one more time here. I love computers. <laughs> they work great till they don't. <laughs> All right, come on, computer. Hey, it's working, I think. Yep. All right, super, everybody. Um, growing degree days, you know I always start out with that. It's getting, it's progressing, and we are certainly into the end of summer. We're a little ahead of what we typically are, 
And one of the things I find interesting, this is a, a Sweet 16 Apple. It's one of my favorites. It's typically a mid-September apple, but down in the Yankton area, and I know this is a Sweet 16, a Sweet 16 uh, apple down there that is just about ripe. Now, it's not quite. Color change is just starting, so it does have a few more weeks. But it might end up being about two weeks early. Sweet 16 is one of my favorites. Obviously, apples, there's a lot of bias in that. I like it because it has a slightly kind of a kind of a cherry, like a cherry uh, lifesaver might be a good way to describe it. And, and I kind of like that taste. So uh, if you do, it's nice. But I've seen uh, in the southeastern part of the state, assuming they're getting water, um, things are a little ahead in terms of harvest. But throughout the eastern part of the state, excuse me, not the western where it's been raining almost continuously, uh, we're seeing drought. And everyone watching this East River might be a good description, particularly if you're up in the Northeast, you know, Marshall County, Day County, uh, Roberts County, all the way down along the Minnesota border, and then everywhere south of Highway 14 and east of the river. Uh, we are seeing drought. And I get call after call of little spruce like this, why is my spruce dying? Why is it discoloring? Why are the needles dropping? Um, and you dig around the base and it's granular. It's powder. It's that dry. So right now, you know, all your trees, a little tree like that, it needs about a gallon of water twice a week. So that's two gallons a week. Added slowly. Your big trees, you need the sprinkler set underneath it for a couple of hours even right now. Now, the reason I mentioned you really need to be watering that area, you don't so much in Rapid, but in that area of uh, the southeastern and then the counties along the Minnesota border all the way up to Roberts, is if you remember this last spring, maples and birch primarily, but a few honey locusts, some hawthorns and that, trees that are sensitive to desiccation injury. A lot of those, the tops were dead, just died right out on them. And the reason being, we had a long dry fall. We had a, a dry fall and a long winter. And so the plants went in dry and then they desiccated over the winter, particularly in the spring. So right now is the time period to be watering to reduce winter injury. Any water be watering in August and September, not just before the soils freeze. That's just teasing the plants. Start watering now. If you're not getting an inch a week, and, and I know in some areas, even though it's been dry this summer, the last couple of weeks, the rains have been fairly consistent. So, uh, you know, individual sites are important, but drought is still an issue out there. Now, for those of you that are regular viewers of Garden Hour, you remember last week that uh, Amanda and I were going back and forth on this plant. And we figured out it was a dogwood she was talking about. And it wasn't a dogwood saw flies, but it was a small dots and for some reason Amanda and I didn't put the puzzle together or we actually should have and here's a picture remember we asked her to send a picture sent it to Rhoda and Rhoda sent it on to us and these are aphids and, and it was a dumb moment why didn't we think of that because aphids have been a real problem this year particularly in the western part of the state where it's been so wet but I've seen huge aphid colonies on the underside of of dogwood leaves and the dogwood leaves are kind of puckered and curled and if you kind of pop them open you'll see these little aphids scurrying about as they're feeding now what's really cool about this picture if you look really close at your screen uh, you'll find some white dots in there notice that you'll see these black dots those are all the healthy aphids and then you'll see these white dots. Those are the mummified aphids. Those are the aphids that a parasitoid got to. In other words, they laid eggs in them and they burst out of them after they finished feeding. So the point here is this isn't a population that really needs to be controlled. Nothing's going to uncurl the leaves. That's a done deal no matter what you do. But the natural enemies of aphids, which usually quickly take advantage 
of these explosive populations are doing a good job of beginning to bring it down. And any spray you did now, again, isn't going to unpucker or uncurl the leaves. And you're probably going to end up killing a lot of the things that are feeding on aphids. I see a lot of uh, ladybug beetles out and about as well. But this population, despite being as thick as it is, is being dealt with by its own natural enemies that are working for cheap um, and just let them do their job. So for those wondering last week, what were the distorted leaves on a shrub, which we figured out was dogwood, remember, during the episode, but the dots underneath it, which for some reason Rhoda and I didn't put, or excuse me, Amanda and I didn't put together, uh, these are aphids, and they're sucking the sap from the uh, plants. Now, the reason it should have just clicked right away is we have been seeing a lot of aphid problems out there. Uh, if you look really close towards the center of the screen, maybe just slightly to the uh, uh, right side, you'll see these giant conifer aphids. And that's the name, very descriptive, giant conifer aphids. And they're feeding on junipers. I was out looking at some windbreaks of Rocky Mountain juniper over by Faith, South Dakota. And I've seen this also down towards hot springs in a number of areas as I'm swatting mosquitoes. Not a very common practice out here. But because of the weather, I've just seen some real blooms of these. Now, you know, it's interesting. The way I'm able to find them on the junipers is I look for ants. Because the ants are really hurting the aphids. If you grab the branch with your fingers, kind of move your fingers across, you'll find the ants will take notice of your behavior. And they're, they're not really going to attack you. You're a little big. But nevertheless, they'll start scurrying about you as well, going like, what the heck are you? What are you doing? Um, if you want to smash the aphids, go right ahead. But uh, that's how I find aphids on these is the uh, presence of ants. And, and you'll find a little stickiness on it, the honeydew. And, of course, that's that's why the ants are hurting the aphids and protecting them from their natural enemies because they milk the aphids for the sweet, sticky substance uh, called honeydew. So it's kind of a nice little relationship. The aphids get a little protection as well as transport, kind of like cows, and uh, the ants get to milk them. So it's a nice little relationship there. Now, here's another one. These are hawthorn mealybugs. The sap-sucking insect populations this year are just going boom. And this was another one. And if you look close, a lot of them look kind of mummified. Well, that's because you're looking at the old mealybugs. The uh, young ones that are out scurrying on the leaves right now really aren't noticeable. The ones that produce this kind of powdery uh, appearance to them, this kind of like they're sugar-coated, like a, a sugar-coated donut. Uh, it helps protect them from a lot of things, including other things that like to eat them. Um, so we're seeing these right now, and it's you'll find them on tufts along the branches. Uh, you know, as Rhoda mentioned, if we're getting this kind of cottony filament, we might be looking at downy mildew. Well, if they, if they move, you might be looking at mealy bugs instead. Um Update on Emerald Ash Borer for those on the eastern part of our state in Lincoln, Minnehaha, or Union County, the three counties that we've confirmed infestations. By the way, everywhere else I've looked, it has not proven to be Emerald Ash Borer. Not saying it can't be in another county, but we just haven't found it yet. But everything that's been reported up to now from Rapid City all the way up to Aberdeen, uh, nope, they've just been our usual suspects. But right now, we're seeing a little bit more of the third instars. There's four stages of uh, development of the larvae. These are somewhat of the bigger ones. I mentioned that last week. These are burling into a little bit of the sapwood, so they're damaging not only the phloem, the tissue that's moving the sugars, but they're etching the sapwood, which is moving the water. And that's one reason that tr infested trees, we often see wilt rather quickly at this time of year by quickly i mean you'll see it over the next week or two that the upper leaves are maybe drooping a little bit more drying out a little bit quicker and it may be due to these now remember everybody one of the things you really want to look for if you suspect your tree has been infested by emerald ash borer is first make sure it's an ash uh, we have reports of uh, hackberries and walnuts which certainly are an ash 
and look for woodpecker damage. Woodpeckers are very good at finding these trees. And if you see that the woodpeckers are blonding the bark, taking the bark off, and you find the drill holes, the pecks from woodpeckers uh, on an ash that has begun to thin, uh, take a picture or two. Um, you know, send it to me, and I'll take a look at it, and it looks like a suspect. Um, I'll drive by because we certainly want to jump on those very quickly. Look at this one. Isn't this cool? It's a bagworm. Entomologists are very, very unimaginative. Oh, well, we'll call that a bag. I mean, we could have come up with something cooler. Uh, but what that is, is the bagworm is an insect that attacks a number of trees, junipers including. I see this occasionally down in the Yankton area. It kind of reminds me of home uh, because you'd see this a lot in southern Ontario and Michigan, which is really more of a zone five or zone six. These will tolerate it during the winter about minus 20. So quite often our winters are too cold to allow these populations to really become established. Occasionally you'll see them in Rapid City and Pier, which are also our zone five locations. Uh, but uh, what you're going to find here is mom's in there. Mom is a stay at home. She never leaves the bag. Mates with dad who does fly around. Uh, but then she lays eggs, eggs in the bag and then she drops out of the bag and dies. And then the, uh, the eggs remain in there and then hatch in the spring and the larvae uh, move out and start forming a bag around themselves. If they're, um, and then the males come out and fly around and mate with the females and the female spends the whole time in the bag. But you can see they're kind of a minor defoliator that they have to take a lot of those needles together and, uh, and kind of build this big silky and it increases with size as the season progresses on this particular juniper there was probably about 20 bags hanging from it and it was just a shrub and you look down the whole line and they were just covered and i thought oh, i got to get a picture of this you'll find them on spruce spruce and junipers are the two plants i most often see bagworms but they're more of a novelty in our state rather than a serious pest issue um, i think rhoda's mentioned this from time to time uh, powdery mildew on common lilacs. It's as she mentioned, it's kind of a powdery sort of substance on it. And it you don't need moisture. But what you really need are kind of uh, areas with really restricted airflow. And I see that most commonly developed. And at this time of year, powdery mildew and lilacs go together. Now there's also a leaf spot disease and I'm getting some pictures of that coming in. I have not yet gotten a sample. So I can't say for certainly it's the leaf spot disease, but we have a number of problems on lilac, but it seems powdery mildew is one on common lilac I expect to see almost every year, almost regardless of weather. But when I do find it, it's quite often in plantings that are dense, plantings that are partially shaded by trees with low canopies, anything where we get very, very poor air movement. And rust diseases. Now, this I'm seeing uh, in the western part of our state because we've been getting so much rain. And people have noticed that over the last couple of weeks that they say, well, you know what, uh, my cottonwoods look fine. And then we had a few more rains and suddenly the leaves are covered with these little dots. And this is one of the cottonwood rust diseases. There are several. Now, the disease will result in the leaves falling prematurely. And if it's a cottonwood in your yard, it's going to be one more thing you have to rake. Uh, you don't need to really dispose of the leaves because it's a rust disease. The disease actually goes back and forth between hosts. The spores actually from the alternate host travel from a long distance because they're found on larches and Douglas firs, two trees that are not commonly seen in South Dakota. We have them, but not huge populations, but actually the spores can travel hundreds of miles. And if we have what conditions, this disease will uh, develop on the cottonwoods. And the spores from the cottonwoods probably aren't going all the way back. The spores are larger, so they don't travel as far, but it's just one of many rust diseases. But with the uh, moist weather out West, we're seeing quite a bit of it. And then this, 
my what is it fruit that is a persimmons now you might be saying i don't even know what a persimmon is well that wouldn't surprise me persimmon is a north american fruit so it's native here but it does not transport well at all so you're not going to buy california persimmons very often or at least i've never seen them even at trader joe and uh and a couple of those other high-end stores um they're they're more of a local so you go to missouri you can buy them you go to areas out east and south you can buy them uh the fruit is not ripe yet uh that takes about another month to go the fruit's not very large and it has very large seeds in it, and you have to wait until it's really ripe to eat it. Uh, what used to eat it in the environment, they think, has died out. Uh, so there's not too many critters that eat the darn thing. This might have been one of the critters that once roamed North America. But the um, Native Americans used to collect it, of course. It was part of their grocery store. And it is a local favorite. There's actually about 40 different cultivars you can buy. But uh, you might say, well, that's an unusual tree. But here's what's really unusual about this persimmon. I took this picture in Marshall, Minnesota. Yeah. Now, I think it's by luck, but there are a couple persimmon trees uh, that are out there. And uh, you don't see fruit very often on them. But surprisingly, I've never seen any winter injury, and I've watched these trees probably over the last decade or so. So uh, I'll bet there's a gardener out there down in Yankton that has been growing these for years and gets an occasional fruit. Uh, but it's they're not a very common plant. But for those of you in Zone 5, down in the, along the river, even up to Pier, certainly the uh, Rapid City area, it might be one you want to try as a novelty and try several for pollination, of course. Uh, and don't be surprised if you get some dieback, but uh, I've seen very little dieback, but then don't be surprised you don't get a lot of fruit. Uh, but uh, And by the way, if someone is growing it, would they please email? I, I'd like to see it. I promise not to disclose the location, but this is kind of like that pecan tree in Rapid City. You don't know about these until somebody tells you about them. Now, I'm going to end with this. Yeah, it's a box elder tree. For everyone here that has a windbreak or anticipating putting in a windbreak, would you please consider box elder? I know it has a bad reputation. Oh, you get box elder bugs. Who cares? It's in your windbreak. Um, and it's not a real problem. And they live off the seeds. Yes, I know they can get in your house during the winter. But uh, again, it's a windbreak. So hopefully it's not right next to your house. Uh, they're as tough as nails. They tolerate a lot of different sites. They don't like herbicides, I will say that. Uh, but, you know, people have said, well, I don't want to plant. I don't want to plant. Well, you're not planting ash. You're not planting a couple of other trees anymore. Would you consider this? And this is a box elder seedling planted in a windbreak in Walworth County this year. And you go down the entire row. Survival was incredible. I, I, I would say near 100%. And look at the growth in one year. These were two feet tall. Uh, and you look at the surrounding trees that were tried, you know, the, the hackberries and that, and then they're all doing fine. But they're not doing anywhere as well as these trees. So um, Nathan Kafer, who's our agroforestry specialist within the South Dakota Department of Ag and Natural Resources, has been promoting these for specific locations. And, and, and I am as well. So if you're looking to put in a windbreak in, don't just dismiss box elder. It, it's not a perfect tree. It's not going to work well on every site. But it's one we ought to consider more often. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing. I apologize for the uh, for the goof up there in the beginning. Who knows? It's a computer. The, you know what? I, you know, that's the one thing I, I hate about computers. They just sometimes go bizarre. And I don't know about you, Rhoda, but when I call IT, their solution is always, have you, have you shed it off and started it again? And I'm thinking, my gosh, what if we did that for everything? There's something wrong with the plane you're flying in. Shut everything <laughs> off and start the engines again. 
<laughs> oh, your car, it's making a funny sound. Just stop on the highway and start it up all over again. For some reason on computers, we'll tolerate that. Anything else we'd have to say, are you crazy? <laughs> uh, I, now, I'm sure there's good reasons for shutting them off and starting, and usually it works. Uh, but I'm glad it does. I'm glad I'm not on a Delta flight where they say, we're just going to shut everything down. <laughs> And then we'll start everything up in a minute or two and see how well it flies. Maybe they All right. Well, that's you my, don't know that's, it. <laughs> that's my computer rant for tonight. Uh, but do we have any questions, Rhoda? We do not. Oh, oh my gosh. I, I was going to comment, though, on the box elder. Uh, then when it gets gets old enough, he can tap it for sugar. Yeah, yep, that, that's <laughs> true as well. Thank you for reminding me of that. And uh, we have tapped them. Um, uh, Dave Graper tapped him out here at, uh, McCory and that, and I've tapped him down in the, uh, Pine Ridge area. And, uh, some of them, there are some box elders are as sweet as some sugar maples. In other words, <laughs> sugar maples that are at the bottom of their range for sugar. There are some box elders at the top of their range. And so there is a slight overlap even. Um, quite often, it they're not as sweet. By the way, it's a sugar. It's not going to, well, I don't want to taste box elder juice. It, it's no <laughs> juice. It's called sugar. You boil it down. You boil it down and you get it. Hey, Rhoda, have, I, I know you like fruit. Have you ever tried persimmons? I don't think I have. Yeah, it's. I grew uh, up in Nebraska. We, we must have had some around somewhere. Oh, but oh my goodness! Yeah, they have them in Nebraska, <laughs> uh, but I mean they don't have orchards in Nebraska, You're so right. they have individual ones. But uh, I'll try to grab some later. About frost is when they're ready to eat. Mm. It has nothing to do with getting cold, but it's just the season progresses that long, and you've got to pull the seeds out. Don't eat those. <laughs> uh, and, and there's a lot of don'ts to eating persimmons. It's an acquired taste. Uh, but uh, kind of a custard-like flavor to them. Uh, doesn't taste like chicken, which is our usual go-to for anything. <laughs> right. But, uh, uh, but yeah, I I kind of like them. I'm, I mean, I'm not a big fan of them. It's kind of like lutefisk. It's, you, you eat it to prove you can. Uh, but I'll bet there's people out there that really enjoy persimmons. Uh, they get a little mushy and they're sweet. So anyway, I was kind of excited to see that. It's <laughs> that and bagworms. My week, the excitement of my week was persimmons and bagworms because I don't get to see them very often where I did frequently in Southern Ontario and Michigan. Speaking of taste, uh, the breeder of Sweet 16 described it as pink bubblegum flavor. Oh, that's interesting. Pink <laughs> bubblegum flavor. Somehow I think yours <laughs> sounds more attractive. <laughs> yeah, cherry lifesavers. And, and that's <laughs> my description of them. Uh, it's not quite as sweet as cherry lifesavers, but to me, I get that hint of flavor. Yeah. Bubblegum, I, no. Nah, I, <laughs> I, I mean, hey, hey, they came up with it. And by the way, um, it's not everybody's favorite apple. I'll say that. Uh, and, and it does have some disease problems. It's not one of our, our most disease free trees, nor is it most uh, disease prone. Um, you know, a lot of people like the honey crisp and that that's been, been a, a big favorite and Harrelson's are kind of the traditional and, and they're good, but, um, uh, but for me, that mid-season apple I like. And, of course, there's some early-season apples that are pretty good as well. But the nice thing is we're coming into the fruit season, and uh, for apples at least. And uh, you know what? I always enjoy that time here. It's nice to go out and pick fruit from an orchard. One thing about Sweet 16, it likes to grow with its arms straight up. So it does need some training to bring those down a bit. <laughs> it, it does. But, you know, what? that's one way I can kind of, I'll quote, identify them at a distance <laughs> is they, they're more of an upright apple than, uh, than what you typically see. And you're right. We don't want upright apples. We want them to spread out. And, and that one does require some training to do that. Um, it, otherwise you're going to get somewhat of a more upright tree. It's not a horrible thing, but, uh, but yeah, thanks for mentioning that. There are some differences in form, uh, for that tree, but I like the striping to it. I think it's a pretty tree. I don't know what it is. I like it. I, I looked at the last house I lived in, in Duluth 
planted one there and I think 85 and was up there looking at it this year and they just cut the darn thing down. I don't know why new people, you know, they don't want fruit right. in their yard. Right. I don't know what's wrong with these people. You know, if they don't <laughs> like the fruit, well, just shut it off and start it up again. Maybe it won't produce fruit. I don't know. That's a joke. People. <laughs> <laughs> you do have a question, a couple of questions. Sure. Um, how far apart to plant box elder? Okay. As a windbreak. Now, I guess what we're looking at, we're probably looking at about 16 feet. Uh, that's a good spacing for hardwoods because you do want them to grow together and that, so you get that benefit. So I'd go for about that for, for again, for windbreaks. And then can you comment on the planting of trees as part of uh, controlling carbon emissions? Okay. <laughs> um, you know, I, People, I, I wish I could say they'd be great at that. Um, and maybe a lot of you have heard, you know, the Amazon is the lungs of the earth and all this. And, and I'm not trying to take away from that. I, I certainly don't want to see the Amazon River Basin cut, nor do I want to see forests particularly cut other than for useful purposes. But we forget there's two sides of the equation. Trees do undergo photosynthesis where they're taking carbon dioxide and utilizing that as a building block. But what we forget is they also undergo respiration, uh, just like we are. Uh, and so they're taking in oxygen and giving off carbon dioxide. Now, uh, younger trees are a little bit better at that and that they're building. And so for that, there's a real plus. But if you look at over mature, mature force, and you look at the entire force, so now we're looking at everything in it, it's almost a wash, according to a lot of studies, in that they take in as much as they release. Now, the one thing I will add, though, is that one of the problems we do have is when we take forests and they burn, kind of like what we're seeing in, out in Hawaii right now, or we do see in the Amazon River Basin that. The problem with that, we get a tremendous amount of carbon being released at once. And if you take a look at the net carbon increase globally, burning forests is one of the biggest contributors to this. Whereas if you turn them all into two by fours, you've captured that carbon now into furniture and that. So, you know, the harvesting trees for valuable purposes, you know, wood, for example, is a good way of retaining that carbon. Burning force is a bad way because carbon <laughs> that has been built up over, you know, perhaps centuries, at, at least decades, is now almost instant really, instantly released. And so don't burn force. <laughs> How's that? One, one thing in trees uh, favor with carbon is... Um... In for in cities without trees, uh, the, those areas of of the southwest or the south that uh, don't have many trees are having much more problems with heat island effect, and in poor areas of the city that don't have many trees. Um, yeah. So, so that's a really good place to be planting trees. To be it, it is, and, and and two pluses for <laughs> urban trees. One is shade. I mean, you walk beneath a canopy of large trees over the street, over your house, transpiring moisture back. Uh, it is very cooling. I mean, there used to be streets in Brookings that were covered with elms, and you could walk them on a hot day, and, and, and it was easy to do. When they died and they were replaced with crab apples, well, yeah, don't walk under a crab apple very well. And the other thing, just as a reminder, is trees are very good at picking up particulates. And so dust in that, you know, the, the smokes we've had in that, they're good at kind of holding those. So there's a lot of positives to planting trees. Don't look at them as, okay, they're going to take all the, the carbon out, but look at them as really nature's air filters, which they are, and nature's cooler. So I'd certainly advocate more tree planting. <laughs> and, and I think we're at time. That's a good note we to are. end on. Plant trees. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> well, we thank you for joining us tonight, and we will be on for a couple more weeks yet uh, at the same time, same same station, and uh, wish you all good week and good growing. And thank you, John. Thank you, Rhoda. And thanks, everyone, for watching. Goodbye. <laughs>